Good morning. This is Dan Corder in the morning. South Africa's a movie. Welcome to the watch party. As you know already, five mornings a week is your newsworth knowing South African podcast. And one morning a week, which is this morning this week, we also put it on YouTube so you can look at me if you want to. If you are watching the show, you might be thinking, damn, Daniel. Back again with the white vans. No, back again with a much nicer place. And I know that there's some controversy about where I'm exactly living at the moment because I keep recording from different places. Don't get too excited. This beautiful room I'm in is Editor Eric's house <laughs> because we are in Cape Town. Uh, my brother and I for a young holiday jaunt and also a little bit of a break around my birthday. Editor Eric's setup is so nice. That white guitar over my left shoulder, so for your camera right, is nothing I know what to do with or how to do with it. But if you ask very nicely, Maybe one day I will bully editor Eric into playing guitar on the show. Fun fact for the super fans in the universe of all of our shows is that editor Eric created the intro song for the Dan Corder show, the original one in the kind of like punk rock electric guitar style. And then Copano Jazz Collective, uh, I guess, converted it into what it is now. But yo, editor Eric, multi-talented. I would say triple threat, but I think there are way more threats than that much like threats to American democracy, but today is not about Elon Musk. Okay, here's what we're gonna talk about today. So the first thing I wanna talk about is, and particularly if you are watching on YouTube, you may, you may have missed the conversation that we've had this week already about the state of South African media. We've had it on the podcast. You can go stream it on Spotify or Apple or wherever else you'd like to get your podcast. We were speaking firstly about the SABC bill, about why the SABC is so important to South Africa, so important to the whole country in many, many different ways. And then we also spoke about why it's always broke and that honestly suggests if it always goes broke, why it is broken. And we spoke about how its funding model is out of date, how its sales model and, and, and it's like internal structures don't make sense. The bureaucracy leaves the SABC fundamentally commercially uncompetitive and how things need to change and be fixed. So if you want to go hear more about that, happened earlier on in the week. We then yesterday spoke about how South African journalism has been hollowed out by a variety of different factors in the last 10, 15 years and how Twitter, particularly since Elon bought it, oh, I am speaking about Elon, since Elon bought it has made it way way worse and has an effect on South African journalism not just the fake news not just the bot networks not just the propaganda and the hatred and the bigotry and the lies but how it's affecting South African journalism itself and so many people have been getting onto the whatsapp line to talk about it that we're going to follow the whatsapp line on a lot of really interesting points that have been sent through by different recorders uh, today uh, remember if you want to get onto the whatsapp line and contribute 0607613436 and yes to those of you asking it is really me texting you back so if you don't get a text back i didn't like you no i'm joking shame that's not true it's just a lot of texts you can't get through them all people who've done really well understand and then the second thing i want to talk about is this enormous potential fraud of sasa of the srd grant we've spoken about a lot on this show the uh what's it social relief of distress grant that started as a 350 rand grant during covid and it was a covid relief grant and now it's a 370 rand grant we've spoken also about the court case ongoing to try and make sure that millions of south africans who deserve and are entitled to that grant actually get it the grant is designed for people for whom 370 rand a month is a life-changing life improving amount of money so we're talking about very impoverished and vulnerable uh, vulnerable people who the infrastructure and the design and the system of our society south african life has really struggled with uh, or, or like dealt a very bad hand to and i want to talk about two teenagers an 18 year old and a 19 year old computer science students from stellenbosch university who it seems have uncovered massive rampant social grant fraud at SASA of the SRD grant by what it looks like is at least one or many criminal syndicates. It's something we need to talk about, something we need to know about. And we also need to sometimes go like, wow, the kids are all right. Like these are children, 18, 19 year old teenagers doing things that, you know, private investigators and forensic investigators and investigative journalists didn't manage to figure out. And it's really, really, really important. So Let's start with the state of South African media as a whole. And even as I record this right now, uh, on Thursday morning, we are getting fresh texts and messages on the WhatsApp line. But I'm gonna start with a text in from Marcus saying, good morning, Dan, and everyone else. I just listened to your uh, take on Twitter and journalism and really appreciate your perspective as a journalist, not a journalist, Marcus. 
I don't have time to explain that right now, but I'm going to take it to my grave. Okay, uh, Marcus says, I'd like to add two factors that make Twitter journalism problematic. So I was talking yesterday about how uh, the digital media age has created an information influx of free and easily accessible information and advertising through that, which most people now get information from. And that how that has destroyed the advertising model and subscription-based model of traditional legacy media, whether it be TV uh, or newsprint, read journalism, written journalism, and how the response from these uh, particularly written journalism uh, publications is to try and churn out as much material as possible. It's a quantity game, not a quality game. And the journalists are getting incredibly overworked because it's not as though these news media publications have hired more journalists to churn out more articles because they can't afford to because they're going through a financial advertising crisis. And so these journalists have now had to repurpose themselves to deliver sometimes 5, 10, even 15 articles a day. And the best way that they can do that with the limited time they have is to go to places like Twitter where they can justify to their editor by saying, look, it's trending. Everyone's talking about it. People will want to read about this if we do it first or do it early or do it comprehensively to wrap up this story. And the editor goes cool because the editor wants to click some traffic and audience engagement. And then they write it, uh, but, uh, and sorry, it's very easy to write because you're essentially just quote tweeting. You're essentially just embedding tweets and saying South Africans are talking about this and then you churn it out and that's one of your 10 done. But as Twitter has descended into madness and bots and unregulated lies and hatred and bigotry and propaganda uh, since Elon Musk shellacked it after he bought it. It has meant that more and more you are able to manipulate the big stories on Twitter to make it look like you are trending. But you only need 500 to 1,000 tweets within about an hour or two on Twitter, which you can easily get through bots or even just the people at your work if you work hard enough to get a top trend. And then the, the, the journalists go, wow, everyone in South Africa is talking about this, even though there are so few people on South African Twitter at all. Then they write an article, then everyone else reads it and they go, wow, everyone's talking about this. And then you've got South Africans believing that there are ten, tens of millions illegal of uh, illegal immigrants crossing the border every single year, when actually in total there are at best estimates, less than 6 million illegal immigrants total, not per year, total full stop in the country right now. And that's a problem. So Marcus says, I'd like to add two factors that make Twitter journalism problematic. One, social media has decreased our attention span to a few seconds. It used to be five to six. Now it's down to two to three. That's how much time we take to decide whether something is worth our time or not, whether it's a, on a website, a news story or a TikTok video. We simply don't take the time to think before we make decisions anymore. We respond with our gut. That together with Elon's genius business model of paying viral content creators, something else we spoke about yesterday, incentivizes people to focus on effect rather than content. It's less about what you say and more about how you say it. Absolutely true. Secondly, Marcus says, online heat maps have shown that most people don't read further than the headline of a story. And if you've ever been on Twitter, you will know that that is true because how many people read the headline don't click on the link, don't read it through, and then there's a huge conversation about it. Marcus goes on, many, many people don't even click the link to a story, so all they see is the headline being tweeted. Sorry, I just said that, Marcus. <laughs> this means that nuance goes out the window because how much can really you can you really convey in a headline, especially when that headline's main purpose is to gain attention, i.e. clickbait. Troubling time for journalism, so I'm grateful that you're starting the discussion. Have a great day, and please make screenshot a thing. Yes, Marcus and everyone else, that is the correct past tense of to screenshot something. You screenshot it. But that doesn't mean that you screen shit it. Please beep that, guys. Okay, so next message from the WhatsApp line on this discussion. Magashe says, is it some sort of statement calling it Twitter and not X? Yes, Magashe, it is. We own Twitter, the people. And not to come off all socialists about this, but we owned and made Twitter what it was years before Elon decided to buy it. And just because he owns it now and can affect it doesn't mean that he has taken it away from us. And X sucks. And Twitter is better than X. So for as long as I am on Twitter, the fight is to make it more like Twitter used to be and keep some of the Twitter light alive. And then finally, we have Tsepo. Tsepo texted, good morning, Dan. I just listened to today's podcast. And as you were talking about the fear mongering of other publications, you described your shows as something like the DCU, the Dan Quarter Universe. And it gave me flashbacks of that scene where Loki tries to threaten Tony Stark in. I think it was the Avengers, the Age of Ultron. So you know how Loki said, we have an army. And I pictured those that tried to sway public opinion using some publications be like we have ENCA IOL EWN and record his reply as uh, reply as cool as when Tony said we have a Hulk but instead we say we have a Dan that's very generous of you <laughs> and I don't think that the metaphor lands but we're there for it 
Okay, let's talk about these phenomenal, phenomenal teenagers. Their names are Joel and Veer. Joel, I think it's pronounced Cedras, and Veer Gosai. They are 18 and 19 years old. One of them is from Johannesburg. One of them is from Cape Town. And they met in computer science class first year at the University of Stellenbosch. And in September, just now, September earlier this year, I think it was, yes, Joel turned to his friend Veer and said, Dude, you'll never believe this. I apply. I applied for an SRD grant, a 370 rand social relief or distress, distress grant in February. And Sasa told me that my ID number had already been registered. There was already an application and that it's even possible that, you know, there had been payouts made to this applicant using my ID. And Via went, that is crazy. That's probably, I mean, that sounds like identity theft unless it's some kind of like programming problem. And then Via went and he put in his ID number. He's a, never applied for any social grant, anything with Sasa ever. And his ID was registered to an applicant on the Sasa website for the SRD grant, which meant that maybe somebody was receiving their 370 uh, rand a month off of Veer's ID. And then Veer and uh, Joel went to their friends. And I say their friends, not because they don't have friends, but because they had the article claimed they had 60 friends. Now I know I'm 31 years old, but 60 friends is too many friends. I, how do you, in this economy, that many friends? Absolutely not. I don't care how popular you are, Joel or Veer. I'm just going to say 60 classmates. So they got the 60 classmates. The 60 classmates handed over all of their ID numbers. And only two of their classmates had actually applied for a grant. So of the 60, two had applied, but also of the 60, on the SRD grant application for Sasa, 58 of them, according to Sasa, had applied, had actually submitted applications and potentially got money with their IDs. 58 out of 60 people, whereas only two of those 60 people actually had done so. So Joel and Veer were thinking, oh my word, have we just uncovered fraud from some kind of criminal syndicate, some kind of organization that is fleecing Sasa of 370 rand a month per false or stolen identity? Because it's, 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 it's fraud and identity theft. So then, because they're cool computer science kids, these are the real Tony Starks, they uh, made a or developed a piece of software that could uh, mass process a bunch of IDs uh, or at least ID numbers through the Sasa um, online portal to find out how many of them had applications open with Sasa. And they did it for February 2005, which, uh, and the reason why they did that is because that was when Joel was born. So they did it February 2005, same month that Joel was born. And they came up with 75,000 applications for that birth year. All of these, what's that, 18, 19 year olds for that birth month of that year, people born then, who had allegedly applied for grants with Sasa. Only 82,100 people were born in February 2005, which means that if all of those applicants, all those applications were real and legit, 91% of people born in February 2005 had applied for this grant. Okay, one, that is statistically impossible, like absolutely st statistically impossible when you look at unemployment figures, when you look at grant usage figures, when you look at the kinds of people who'd be eligible for this kind of grant, insane. I know I said one, that was actually three, I got my numbers wrong there, I got too excited. But like, that is absolutely impossible that 91% of all the people born in February 2005 had applied for this grant. And so what Joel and Veer did was they uncovered what is almost certainly a massive criminal syndicate using identity theft and fraud to mass enter and create applications through ID numbers of people who don't know that it is happening to try and withdraw 370 rand a month per ID application. And I know 370 rand a month can sound like a little to people who don't need it. But if you are doing it for 75,000 people from, Jan from February 2005 alone, that is an insane amount of money. And it's very serious in terms of the criminality of it. And now, and then actually Joel and V were taken to parliament. They spoke in front of a parliamentary working committee. Uh, all of the uh, MPs were like, that's very serious. That's very bad. Except the ANC one who was like, no, this is evil and lies. And it's made up and it's fake with no justification. Because of course, the ANC, you know, social grants is their thing, a big thing for obvious reasons. And now there's further investigations into it. And Joel and Via have actually created a way where you can go and put in your ID number to see if there is a fake account, or at least identity theft and fraud taking advantage of your identity uh, to get money for some kind of shady criminal syndicate that is yet to be uncovered. So one, terrible that this has happened. 
But two, I have to say, amazing that these two teenagers with first year computer science have contributed such an incredibly important piece of information, such an incredibly important discovery, unmasking, exposing of this criminality. They're just kids. They're writing first year exams right now at Stellenbosch University. And that's amazing in a bunch of ways. One, the potential for technology if we were to learn, and I'm, I don't know how to do it, but like if other people we were to learn how to use technology effectively, we could all really, really make contributions like this and uncover a whole bunch of nonsense across South Africa's internet and the world's internet. But two, I have to say, these kids did not need to do this. And they just chose to in their spare time out of their own interest and they uncovered something extraordinary and scary and then they tried to contact Sasa and Sasa ignored them and then they took it to the media which then is how it ended up in parliament. It's just incredible. Like, and I have to say, everybody's down on the youth. Everybody's like, oh, the youth don't vote, the youth don't care, the youth don't know about anything. Now one, I, that's just not true. Like the youth are no more apathetic than at any other previous generation in human history. But two, look at these kids. Maybe as Whitney Houston said, we should like teach them well or let them teach us well and let them lead the way. Like, frankly, that is amazing. And it gives me in this horrible story a whole chunk of hope about South Africa and where it's going, that there are young people like this doing phenomenal things like this. And I know that now after everything I just said, including you, the, using the words kids so often about late teens, I now sound very old. I will remind you, as we learned earlier this week, that I am 31 and have no gray hairs yet. Just very pale ones that I think could be orange if I squint. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Dan Corder in the morning. Let me know uh, what you think on all of this on 0607613436. And we will be back tomorrow for the Friday edition of the show.